Morning. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Simon Webster's Anatta Monday seems to be catching on. Uh, so welcome back to uh, to Monday. It's 10 o'clock. I'm going to get some T-shirts branded, but I thought um, I'd better check with Simon first for copyright. <laughs> uh, have you have you seen an Atom Monday or something like that? We've got to do, we've got to come up with a a witty uh, a witty strap line. Uh, good morning. Uh, we've got a few people in this morning already. Good, good. Yeah, feel free to pop us a message in the Facebook group. If it's your first time attending live today, then you might have to fill in the ecam uh, link, which is uh, on the top of the show notes, and you click on that, and then I can get access. Uh, to uh, uh, to your details, so I can see your picture and see your name, like Stevie here. <laughs> it is an Atom Monday, and then, uh, but if you haven't clicked it for a couple of weeks, maybe or not this session, then I get uh, this. Uh, so, morning, my colleagues. Um, good to see you, but unfortunately, your name's not popping up. So, if you could just click on that ecam link, that'd be great. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Isabella. We're getting the usual crowd in. Good to see you this morning. Uh, cool. So we're going to uh, crack on with um, uh, adding on the layers for the hip and the pelvis. Uh, we're going to mainly focus around the around the hip. And last time we did all of this, we didn't really go into the pelvic floor very much. So when we get to the muscles section. Uh, we're, um, we're going to divide it up over a couple of weeks, so we'll focus mainly on the hip because we do get a lot of um, uh, a lot of therapists in, a lot of fitness professionals. So I thought I'd focus it around there. <coughs> ah, it's Tristan. Ah, okay, cool. I thought it might be. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, so we we focus around the hip. So I'm going to do an additional session on the muscles around the pelvic floor as well. Uh, I know a lot of you are studying uh, kind of male and pelvic health. Uh, issues so obviously um having the uh, knowledge of the anatomy there is good there he is morning tristan and good morning uh becky uh cool right then so uh yeah last week we looked at the bony anatomy of the of the pelvis so all of the uh, kind of sticky out bits and we talked about the anomalies in these areas as well and the uh, reliability of testing in these areas and that's been quite a a hot topic. Uh, I think it was Tristan brought it to our attention uh, last week about the chat with Diane Lee and Adam Meekins. And um, while whilst it was good, I don't think they kind of, I don't think they kind of went at it enough, really. And because um, there was a lot of things that were said that really we need to drill down into the into the detail of of those. Um, and that one of my main issues with palpating around this area is the inconsistency with the bony anatomy so if even if you are feeling the anomaly uh, if the things that you're feeling are different from side to side then the information can't be reliable so um yeah we've got to uh, i think that that, that was kind of missed a, li a little bit really i don't know whether i Maybe I drifted off on that bit if they did discuss it, but I, d I don't feel like they drilled down into that detail. So uh, you can have big changes in these bony landmarks. Uh, so the PSIS around here and the ASIS on the front as well, uh, which we usually use as for palpatory examination. And, uh, the, rel uh, and the, the thing that Diane mentioned in that talk was about the positioning of the of the operator so whoever's doing the examination and it's actually a, um, an old colleague of mine Joe Abbott that's doing the research uh, that if you have your arms or your head in the different place then that will change what you see so if we've got that we've then got the changes in the bony anatomy and we may have differences in the operator's morphology so if the position of the arm is going to make a difference then surely their anatomy is going to make a difference as well. So there are so many variables when we're trying to assess these things. So we have to kind of um, strip it right back and, and say, well, do we actually need that information to uh, to help people? And um, and maybe uh, maybe not. Um, yeah, cool. Yes, I I, I agree. Yeah, I, th I think he did a bit. And um, uh, so uh, yeah, hopefully there is a, a part two. And uh, we can drill into that detail a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. 
I know. Um, yeah, it was. Um, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, I, t- I, I don't want to uh, criticize people individually, but um, kind of concepts I'll, I'll criticize. Um, and where, yeah, when you look at the the so many variabilities in that palpatory examination, um, that yeah, how can we get useful information? And then how can we see change? Because if you've got your arm in a different position, so therefore you're going to feel it differently, then is it your arm that was different or was it the pelvis that was moving different? And this is the thing. You, I, I don't think you can reliably do that. And, and I don't think you need to. So, um, yeah, hopefully it will, if you have learned those kind of things, then may, maybe it will make you think again when we look at the changes that you can get here. So I was, I was talking about the, um, the iliac uh, crest as well and the, and the size of the ilium. So the size of the ilium can be different from side to side. So uh, you and and it can be significantly different as well. So if you stand someone and you're doing a um, an examination of the pelvis, we used to do this all the time in osteopathy. We used to put our hands over the iliac crest and then we go, yeah, that side's a bit higher. Um, but it could actually be that this ilium is just bigger, and um, and and it's their bony anatomy or your arms in. <laughs> <laughs> extended a bit further on that side so um yeah there, there's loads of variation in the anatomy so uh, to have something that's so variable give you reliable results is um is very unlikely okay so uh yeah uh, hopefully you got that from uh, from the last session uh, so we looked at the uh, asis the aiis uh, so the asis if you've never heard of that before it's the anterior because it's at the front superior because it's high or the the most superior part um iliac spine so this is the iliac spine here so it's the front of that bit basically and then the psis around the back are these bits here so the posterior superior iliac spine okay so that those bits we uh, we looked at we looked at the joint in between as well so the sacroiliac joint uh we looked at the different regions of the pelvis so we had the um uh, the ischium ischium area so that's your sit bones area had the pubis around the front, so where your pubic bones are, and then the ilia uh, or ilium around the side. Uh, and remember, this was the anominate bone, so the no bone with no name that has a name. Okay. Uh, then we had uh, this bit here. So these are going to be important today. So this bit here is the ischial spine. Okay. So we uh, had to look at these, and then and then these notches here. So that's the greater sciatic notch, and that's the lesser sciatic notch just there. And uh, when we come down to do the pelvic floor and pelvis, that lesser will become a little bit more important. Uh, and when we do the uh, the main nerves going down the back of the leg, then the greater sciatic notch will be uh, quite important as well. Okay, so that was a bit of a recap of last week. So we will uh, crack on with this week. Um, again, the, the, um, I've had a couple of messages, which I think is brilliant, uh, because people have... Um, I've not felt confident enough to ask a question in the group. And um, and I get that. That's that's no problem at all. So if you want to message me um, about something that you feel, oh, I don't want to be asking this. Everyone's so much more cleverer than I am. Um, then feel free to message me. It's not a problem at all. Uh, um, but uh, the the beauty of asking the question in the group, on this group does, is not judgy, and if they are, then they're out. <laughs> okay, so we, we don't do that at all. And um, uh, yeah, we'll. Um, most people are very, very supportive of helping other people, and you might be asking a question that somebody else might be thinking, but they didn't have the courage to ask as well. So if you just type away, just ask the questions, it's not a problem. But if you don't feel confident enough to do that, that's not a problem either. Then you can just drop me a message. OK, so whatever uh, you feel is um, better for you. Uh, cool. Right, let's go. So uh, hip and pelvis connective tissue. So I've, I've mainly concentrated around the hip. And then when we get to the kind of pelvic floor area and into the lumbar spine and sacrum, then um, we'll, we'll focus a little bit more about the, around those connective tissues as well. Um, so let's uh, have a look at this. So uh, <laughs> highly unlikely, in my opinion. <laughs> Is that controversial? Oh, dear. Uh, so ligaments of the pelvis. Um, so uh, pelvis in the hip. Okay, so that's what we're that's what we're focusing on today. 
so these are the regions that we are going to be looking at. Let me just move things up there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't you can't ask the you can't question your own uh, your own existence, Tristan. Surely. Uh, right. Let's uh, look at this. So we've got. Uh, so this is your ilia. Just here. So this is the looking at the front of the pelvis um, on the uh, right hand side. So you're looking at their right right side. Uh, so that's the ASIS, which we were uh, just talking about a second ago. So that bony bit at the front there. So if you imagine it, um, can't do it the way around, but it'd be this side, okay, on that on that right side as, as you're looking at it, their right side. Um, uh, yeah. So ASIS here. That's your iliac crest. So that's the bit you can feel all around the outside. And then that links into the sacrum and the uh, lumbar spine at the back. So we've got some ligaments up here that we're, we're not going to talk about right now. We'll do these when we get to the lumbar spine. But hopefully you'll be able to work out where they go to because of the names of them. So anterior is at the front, so towards the front. Sacroiliac, so from the sacrum to the ilium. And um, and then it's a, a broad ligament that goes across the uh, go, goes across the front. So you can work out now. Now you know the bones and the areas of the bones. You can work out where these ligaments go to. These are absolutely solid. And um, I was having a chat with someone the other day, uh, and to actually get some um, a re relatively large amount of movement within uh, the sacrum, unless there's a connective tissue disorder. Uh, you have to cut through these ligaments, uh, obviously, in a cadaver. So if you're trying to move the ilium in a cadaver, it, it all moves together. Obviously, it's not living, so it is different to normal living tissue, but the joint is solid, okay? And to get any kind of um, uh, major movement in there, you have to cut through those ligaments to open, open up all of the connective tissue around it to get to get some movement coming from that joint, any significant amounts of movement. Uh, so I think last week we talked about um, the amount of degrees of movement. So it's, it's around about two or three degrees up until 18. So uh, there's, a, there's obviously a big variability in, in the movement with, with individuals. But the reason why is because of this, this ligamentous structure and also the weight of the body pushing down on the sacrum and the sacrum's like a wedge. Okay, so it's literally wedging itself in the ilium. And if it was too floppy, you wouldn't be able to transfer forces from the ground into your, in, through the ilia into your upper body. So, uh, because the, if you imagine like having um, a kind of jelly structure in the middle, you use the ground reaction forces to move your body. And if there was something that wasn't very stable in the middle, then it would, all the forces would just, um, di dissipate. So you, you, you wouldn't be able to use all of that elasticity in the connected tissue to be able to propel yourself forward. So it's, uh, it has to be a stable region. Okay. And, it, and, and like I said, you try and palpate the movements in two degrees when you've got all of those ligaments on there, plus all of the muscles as well, and all of the other connective tissue and the thoracolumbar fascia, which we'll talk about when we get to the uh, when we get to the lumbar spine, there's a lot of stuff there um, that makes palpating that bit, that joint in there, virtually impossible, if not impossible. Okay, so uh, I think that's uh, uh, some of the struggles that we have. Um, so what else have we got today? Yes, yeah, so we're going to focus on these ones today. So sacrotuberous ligament. So hopefully the names will give away where it is. So that this bottom part of the ischium. Um, is your ischial tuberosity. So if you lift your bum up, sit on your hands, and the bit that squashes your fingers, the bony bit, that is your ischial tuberosity. Okay, so that's your sit bones. And there is a big ligament that goes from the sacrum onto that uh, tuberosity. Okay, so that's the sacro uh, tuberous ligament. And then this one here is the sacrospinous ligament. So this one goes from the sacrum onto the ischial spine. So that's the divide between that greater sciatic notch, do it that way. So there's the greater sciatic, there's the ischial spine, and there's the lesser. So that ligament will go from your sacrum onto there, okay? So, um, and if you have a look at it, it creates these two 
gullies. Okay, so there's these there's these holes here. So you, you've obviously got the greater um, uh, sciatic notch just there, and then the lesser one there, and there there is a ligamentous border around those notches, and that will become useful to know when we start adding things on. Okay, uh, and then around the front, we've got this ligament here called the inguinal or inguinal ligament. And you might have heard of uh, inguinal or inguinal hernias, okay? And um, and we'll we'll talk about that a bit more in depth when we get to the abdominal region. Uh, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a look at the structures that pass underneath that today, okay? So inguinal inguinal ligament, and that attaches onto your pubic bone just at the front there, okay? So we've got this big ligamentous structure here. Um, that ligament there forms the insertion point, so the attachments for your abdominal wall. So your obliques, um, transverse abdominis, uh, rectus abdominis to a certain extent, all of those abdominal muscles attach into the pubic bone, so that bit just there, and along that ilia, okay, all the way there. Sorry, somebody's just trying to call me. Just get rid of them. <laughs> okay, and then, so that's at the front, <clears throat> and then round the back, we've got these. Um, so remember here, you had the anterior sacroiliac ligament, so that, that one just there. This one here, we've got a posterior one as well. The, and again, when you see the ligaments on a cadaver, these are solid, absolutely solid. So the, those structures are, um, uh, are, are designed to keep everything nice and stable. Okay, so um, the design uh, fits the purpose. Uh, then we've got here, so that's a different view of the sacrospinous ligament. So you can see it going onto that ischial spine just there. And then here's the uh, sacrotuberous ligament. And you can see just there creeping in. This is the old anatomy trains theory. Okay, so the hamstring tendon goes onto that ischial tuberosity. And then that is then continuous with the sacrotuberous ligament that then is continuous with the um, uh, lats on the opposite side of the body and the glute to a certain extent as well. Um, <clears throat> the only problem is with the anatomy trains model is you can create whatever trains you want out of cadavers. And uh, what they did in the in those first books uh, that Tom Myers uh, wrote, uh, they basically kind of followed their gut. So when you do dissection work, you often don't use scalpels, you do what's called blunt dissections with your hands. So you will feel along a tendon and then you'll pull away tissue that surrounds the tendon um, because as soon as you've cut through it with a scalpel, it's gone and you can't get it back. So you do, um, at the beginning, you do very little di dissection work with a scalpel. And what they did was they did lots of blunt dissection following the lines of stress around people's bodies. Okay, so that's how they came up with these anatomy trains. But you can... Your biases are within whatever you do with your hands on those uh, on those cadavers. <clears throat> so you you can create all manner of crazy spiral patterns or um, linear patterns with, with anybody. Okay, so uh, and that's been a big criticism of the of the anatomy trains. It's too simplistic a model of how the body works. It's it's a nice simplistic model, um, but it's not as simple as they as they make out. Um, cool. So I think what else have we got? Yeah, posterior sacro uh, coccygeal ligaments. So there's uh, ligaments at the back of the coccyx. So obviously the coccyx is separate from the from the sacrum. And yeah, you can see these ligaments here. So iliolumbar. Uh, so from the ilium to the lumbar spine. Again, they kind of make uh, make sense. When I was studying to be an osteo. Um, we must have diagnosed iliolumbar ligament sprain probably about 10 times a week. And then when you speak to people who do operations on people's backs and you ask them about iliolumbar ligament sprains, they say in the 20 years they've been doing surgery on lower backs, they have never once seen an iliolumbar ligament that has been sprained. So basically that person has back pain there. And that's it. And we're trying to make up a diagnosis to fit what the anatomy is around that area. Okay, so again, um, we've got just got to be careful with uh, with pinning our um, or hanging our hats on things that we uh, that we're shown. <clears throat> so round the front, 
We talked about this a little bit last week. We've got the pubic symphysis at the front just here. So this is the connection between the different um, sides of the uh, of the anominate bones, okay, all around the sides there. Uh, and then this, uh, these are your um, anterior sacroiliac ligaments. Uh, so you can see those. That one there, uh, that's a really cool one. So when we get to the, see the spine, uh, this is continuous all the way to your skull. Okay, so from all the way down in the sacrum, all the way up to the base of your skull. This is the anterior longitudinal ligament, this one just here. Okay, so we, we won't be concentrating on that today, but um, yeah, yeah, that's just um, uh, that's just what it is. Hey, Rach, yay, good to see you. Exactly, yeah, good to have you in. You, uh, you've just missed me ranting mainly, <laughs> so don't worry. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's have a look at some of these structures. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, let's do these ones. Let's just get rid of that and that. And hopefully, this one will be the right one. Yeah, here we go. Just move me out of the way. Okay, so if we just give you, <laughs> yeah, who'd have thought it? Uh, so here's the uh, sacrum just here. There's the great, uh, greater sciatic notch. Uh, there's your ischial spine, and there's the lesser sciatic notch. And then there's your bum bones, which are your ischial tuberosities. Uh, that there is the head of your femur. So that's the ball of the ball and socket joint. And we're going to have a look at that in a bit of detail today as well, because there's lots of ligaments around this hip. Uh, and then these we looked at last week. So that's your greater uh, trochanter. That one there is your lesser trochanter. And interestingly, it depends whether you find it interesting or not, um, but... I always thought, because there's some muscles that attach onto there, and uh, I always thought that the lesser trochanter was more medial or more, a bit more anterior, but it's actually on the posterior aspect of your femur. Okay, so it's tucked around the back, and that's important when we think about the actions of the muscles that attach there. So when we get to that, we'll uh, so just kind of store that one. Um, this is your intertrochanteric crest. Okay, and then round the front, you've got the intertrochanteric line. So this one is raised, and the reason why it's raised is because there are lots of muscles that attach all around there. Okay, and the way that you get these bony lumps is because when the muscles start to work and they start to grow as you develop, they pull on the bone, and then uh, it pulls the bone away a little bit, and then it gets filled in with more bone. So those bony landmarks that you can feel are because of the way you have moved and the way you've developed. And this is why everyone's different, okay? Because everyone will, uh, and you'll have different bony anatomy in 18 months time. So if you were sedentary for 18 months, your bones would feel very different to if you were in the gym lifting weights for 18 months, okay? So um, things change. People, uh, people can adapt, the, bo uh, the bod body adapts, the bone adapts. So we're going to have a look at the structures that attach all around here. So these are the ones we've just looked at. Okay, so there, uh, oh, got a, um, a statement, I think, uh, or maybe a question. Uh, this sort of makes sense to my tiny brain. Uh, ground reaction forces has to come up to the middle, the pelvis, yet yeah, um, uh, in order, I think, to be used efficiently. In other words, has to come past the ankle and the knee joints. Yeah, so you need um, stability in those, in those joints. Um, uh, and that's one of the things that we... Uh, that I think we're missing because we keep on um, saying about um, how people need to be have mobility but um, stiffness in the joints is really really important because um, you need that stiffness in the joints to propel yourself forward okay so if things are a bit too floppy you, or you can't control then you, you're going to those forces are going to just disappear into the joint spaces and especially with stiffness in the ankle if you don't have stiffness in the ankle joint when you're jumping or running, then the forces then transfer into the muscles more um, because the muscles absorb the load and the, and the connective tissue. And that's when you start getting issues um, like uh, medial tibial stress. Yeah, so sometimes it's stiffness rather than flexibility that we, that we need. Uh, cool, so we've got the, um, the sacrum here, ilia just here. So hopefully you'll know what this ligament is here. So this is your sacro tuberous ligament and then this one here that's the sacrospinous ligament 
Okay, so th those are the two that we've just had a look at. So there's your ischial spine, back of the uh, back of the hip. So sacrospinous ligament just there, and then you can see the um, uh, sacrospinous one there, sacrotuberous one there. So ischial tuberosity just here. So this is your pubis around the front. And then if we have a look around the back, look, look at the hole it creates there. So that's going to be important later. So sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligament. So we've got these really dense structures. So there's your lesser sciatic notch or foramen and greater sciatic notch or foramen. Okay. So the sciatic nerve will pass through that notch. Okay. So that's, that's really important. Uh, there's your pubis. And that there is something called the obturator membrane. Let me just pause that there a second because we haven't really covered that yet. So we talked about this a little bit last week. This bit here, there's a hole at the front of the pelvis uh, called the obturator foramen. So a foramen is a, is a hole or a gap. But on a, on, a, on a real body, it's not just a hole. So it's not just like that, yeah, which you can poke things through. It's got a membrane over it and the reason for the membrane the membranes are really tough they're actually tougher than the bone if you remember we talked about that down in the ankle um, between the tibia and the fibula you've got these interosseous membranes and they um, uh, the bones will break before they do so these are really really tough structures and what they are in the obturator region are the broad attachment points for the obturator muscles okay so when we get to the muscles bit You'll see, you'll see how it works. So the muscles don't just connect to this bony rim. They also connect to the membrane as well to give it a really solid foundation to be able to contract from. And you've got two obturator muscles. We'll, we'll have a look at those when we, when we get to them. Uh, you can't really see yet, but you'll see in the video in a second. But there's a little hole here. And that is where your obturator nerve will come through. And we talked about that when we did the knee. And the obturator vessels will come through there as well. Okay, so let's just have a look at that. So there's the gap. And through that gap is where your vessels will come from, uh, come, come through. So you, we call them a neurovascular bundle. So neuro is the nerve and then vascular is the blood, blood supply. So both the vein and the artery. So neurovascular bundle. Cool. Okay. Let's have a look at the next bit uh right cool yeah so <clears throat> uh these are just more views of the same thing so this this ligament and um, this pelvis has been cut in half so you can see um from the side so there's your obturator membrane so you can see that in there there's the little gap at the top where the uh, blood vessels and the nerve will pass through pubic symphysis just there um that uh yeah sacrospinous ligament there so that's your ischial spine and then sacrotuberous ligament just there. So the, and, and again, you've just seen these on the model. And then there's your anterior um, uh, sacroiliac ligament just there. So covering that whole, uh, that whole joint. And then we start to look at the lateral aspect. So the side of the pelvis here. And we've got this bit, which we didn't really cover in great detail. Um, but this is called the acetabulum. Okay, and the acetabulum is the socket of the ball and socket. So the femoral head will go into this space here. And actually, this is a real pelvis. Okay, and it's um, you can see it's fairly deep. Uh, the compared to the shoulder, it's really deep. Um, the shoulder socket is like that. Okay, if you can see, it's quite flat. It's got a little bit of a concave surface, but nowhere near as as concave as this. Okay, so th this is um, scooped in. Um, and if you can see there, there's like a C shape. If I can get it, the light in the right area. See that C shape all around there? Uh, and that is a really, really nice, smooth surface. So we call that the lunate surface of the, um, ah, there you go, of the acetabulum. So it's on this picture here. So lunate surface just there, look, all the way around there. Um, and then in that space, obviously not on here because it's connective tissue, not bones, there is a little ligament there, and we're going to show you um, show you some videos uh, about that um, too. Uh, bear with me a second. 
Cool. Right. So, uh, yeah, someone's um, desperate to try and get a hold of me on my phone. <laughs> uh, right. So ligaments of the coxal joint or the, the hip. Um, but in fact, before we do that, let's have a look at the acetabulum. So if we go to these, now the acetabulum is really cool. Um, here we go. So this is what it looks like all together. So these structures, just move me over there. These structures here, this is the capsule of the hip. So it surrounds the whole hip joint. And we're going to have a look at that in a second. Um, but it's not a capsule like the knee. It's These are made up of ligaments. So the ligaments around the hip form the capsule. Okay, And it's a synovial capsule. So it's lined with synovial fluid. So then when you move it and you compress it, it produces synovial fluid to fill fill the joint space. Okay, so let's have a look at that. There we go. Okay, so what we've got, um, obviously on my model, this one's been um, uh, deceased for a while. So all of the connective tissue is gone. There's no, there's nothing left. But what you can see on this one, you can see this rim here. And uh, that is a that's called the labrum. So we've got this layer of uh, very um, dense connective tissue that makes the socket a bit deeper. Okay, and that's really important because we're, um, I'll show you a video in a second. When the femoral head is in that socket, it takes a lot of force to dislocate the hip. Okay, so if you try and pull that femoral head out of the socket. Uh, that labrum creates a negative pressure, so uh, it's and with the fluid in there as well, it's very difficult to uh, to bring the two apart. So let's just have a look at this a second. So the yellowy stuff is the labrum around the outside. So C-shaped labrum there, and that's all part of the the lunate surface. And then you can see that bit in the middle there that doesn't have a labrum on. So just about to point to it there. So all of that area there, that's the acetabular fossa. So basically a fossa is a, is a dip. So there's a, there's a bit that doesn't have a labrum on. Okay, so it's kind of exposed. Um, but there's something else in there, uh, which we'll see in a sec. So the labrum deepens the socket. So that's the labrum attaching all around the, uh, all around the bony rim. And then that little bit there, that is called your ligamentum teres. So there is a little uh, ligament just there that is on the head of your femur and that ligament attaches into the acetabulum. Oh, missed it there. OK, so right into there. And uh, so that creates a, a great amount of stability for that femoral head in the socket, as well as the labrum around it and all the ligaments around it. That little ligament in there as well attaches into the pelvis to stop your femur moving. The other important thing with this ligament is that there is this artery that travels through the ligament. So it's protected by that ligament. You do have a blood supply, which we'll get to when we do the blood supply for the, uh, for the hip, that comes all the way around and supplies the femoral head. But this bit, specifically in kids, so juveniles as they're growing, this supplies the femoral head with blood. So you might have heard of a condition uh, called an avascular necrosis. And avascular means without blood and necrosis means death. OK, so you can have an avascular necrosis of the femoral head. And it's usually with kids okay, where they have real bad hip pain, uh, struggle walking, um, like they call it like a dysplasia where the where the hip doesn't grow properly and it's because well potentially because the hip the blood supply to the femoral head has been disrupted and I've known a couple of kids um, that have had that condition okay so uh, they, their hips haven't formed properly because of the lack of blood so if you've not heard of that before and you know a child that is um, suffering uh, children shouldn't suffer from musculoskeletal pain so if they're getting um, hip issues then uh, that may be one of the differential diagnosis um, if a person didn't have the ligamentum teres what issue could they have so their hip would be a bit more unstable um, and um, uh, 
but they because they would have a bit more a bit more range of motion than they would normally um, they normally should. So uh, yeah, it would it would just you'll be more prone to dislocation basically. There are other ligaments around there which also which you'll see in a second which also help with the stability. Um, but the if you're missing one of them, then yeah, you're just more likely to um, to dislocate. But if you didn't have that, then you're unlikely to have the blood supply. So if you're born without it, then you will probably have an avascular. Well, your femoral head might not even develop in in childbirth uh, as you're as you're developing. So um, yeah, it's it's an important little uh, little attachment point there. Um, yeah, it does take great force to uh, to dislocate uh, the hip. Yeah, they're uh, they're very very strong, uh, very very strong structures. Uh, just gonna and so I'll show you the other end of it. So here's the other end. Just move me over there. So there's the um, there's the other bit of the ligamentum teres. So that bit there attaches into the acetabulum, and the blood supply feeding the top of the femoral head goes into there. Okay. Cool. That, that's something that not a lot of people know about that one. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's quite an interesting one. Okay. So where are we? Yeah. Cool. So the, this is the blood supply, um, which we were just talking about for the uh, for the femoral head. Uh, this is coming from the um, femoral uh, artery. Um, so the the deep femoral artery, which we looked at in the when we looked at the knee. Okay. So this is the profundus. Uh, profound, remember, means deep. If you think of profound, deep and meaningful. So the femoral artery, the profundus, is the deep one. And you've got two circumflex arteries. So circumflex, obviously, just circum, um, circumnavigating, basically, going around the, um, uh, the femoral neck. So you've got a medial one going medially and then a lateral one going laterally. So they feed the femoral head. But if you notice here... So this is the ligamentum, uh, 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 ligament of the head of the femur, so ligamentum teres, and that is the artery that comes off and feeds that bit there. But can you see this here, that there? That's the growth plate line. So uh, this bit uh, becomes sealed off. So you have to get blood supply from that bit to feed that top bit of the femoral head. Um, there, there is a small blood supply there with these uh, retinacular arteries, but this, these arteries mainly feed the bottom part of the head and the neck. Okay, so if there's a if there's a problem here, a developmental issue, or they've had a fall or something like that as a kid, then that can disrupt that blood supply. Okay, so ju just something to think about if uh, you see younger kids with um, hip issues. Uh, da -da -da -da. That's a good question. So is the ligament and tear is therefore compromised with total hip replacements or is it preserved somehow? Yeah, it's gone. Um, when you're an adult, you don't need it for blood supply. It's just there for stability. And um, yeah, they, it's just removed. Um, obviously, depending on which bit you, um, you, which bit you have done, mind you, no, either way, it's going to go. Yeah, um, I don't know of any that preserve it because usually you get a, um, an acetabular uh, implant or you get a femoral head implant or you get both so it's yeah it, uh, and by but by that time hopefully you're in your 80s and um, yeah you you would just need to do loads and loads of rehab exercises to make the muscles really strong to help with the um, active stability of the, of the hip yeah so it, it, it would just be gone cool good questions right uh, next one uh, right then, yeah, so these are the ligaments around the hip itself, and like I said before, these are the ones that form the capsule around the hip. So if you have a look at this, this is, uh, once you know the bony landmarks, you'll know the names, and you'll work out where they go. So this one here is the iliofemoral, so it goes from the ilium part of the pelvis onto the femur. This is an inverted Y shape, so it's kind of flipped around. So it's got one attachment on the ilia, which is just there, so just under the AIIS, and then two attachments on the femur. Okay? And this bit here, it attaches onto your intertrochanteric line, which is the bit that we saw last week. Okay? You've also got around the front your pubofemoral ligament. So this goes from your pubis to your femur. 
Okay, so you can see where they go from and to from their names, hopefully. And then this one here, um, this one goes from the ischial area. So this is your ischio femoral ligament. So from the ischium over to the femur. All right. Um, and uh, yeah, they these are the uh, strongest ligaments in the body. They are really, really tough. So let's have a look at these. Uh, in fact, before we do that, let's have a look at this. So we'll just pop that up there. Okay, um, this might not be a very good image, I don't know, but um, um, I think I've zoomed it a bit too much. There's your femoral head, okay, and it, it's in the acetabulum, all right, and this is on a cadaver, and someone is trying to pull it apart. So let's just um, let's just have a look at that. So there's the there's the head. So you can see it all moving around there. You can see the labrum on the outside. Now they're trying to pull, and it eventually goes. Okay, and then there's the ligamentum teres there. All right, so let, let's just have a look at that again. I can't for the life of me remember where I got this video from. <laughs> okay, and then pull, 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 and then, and then it goes. Okay, so you need a heck of a lot of force to be able to try and pull that out of, uh, out of position. Uh, cool, right, let's have a look at these. So this is the hip capsule. So the capsule is made of ligaments, so all of these around here. It's thinner underneath, so similar to the shoulder, because um, to go into abduction of the leg, you're going to need it a bit thinner there. So just pause that there. So this is your ischiofemoral ligament, yeah? Um, and again, you can't really make it out, yeah? So on here, it's all nicely dissected, and you can see, all oh, there's a line there. There's the iliofemoral. It's just one big mesh. Okay, so, uh, the, and this is where, again, you would, if you were going to dissect it to get these pictures, you would, you would do a blunt dissection to try and get the divide in between the two. So you can see that it's, it's all just one big mesh of, of ligament. Okay, there's, there's just loads around there. And then if we go around to the front, so there's your thickest ligament. Um, so that inverted Y, thickest ligament, which is this one. Um, so that's your il iliofemoral ligament, okay, going from the ilium area onto the femur. Uh, so I've drawn these lines on there so you can see the direction of it. But again, it's just one big mesh. Okay, so iliofemoral there. And then pubofemoral will just be in front of that around there, just that bit there. Okay, so those ones there, let me just pause that, go back a bit. So the ligaments at the front... This one here, iliofemoral and the pubofemoral, if you think about it, it makes sense that as you bring your leg back into extension, those ligaments are going to start to tighten up, okay, so that they provide a lot of stability as your leg goes back into extension, okay? and uh, that, that's the movement that they resist, yeah, so tight into hip extension just there. So this is where it attaches, all the way around the acetabulum, all the way around there around the neck, so it misses out this crest because the muscle's attached there. So it goes around the neck, but then down this line. Yeah, so that's the intertrochanteric line that we saw last week. All right, so, and that, that's where it all wraps around. Cool. And then, <clears throat> if we have a look at this, this is one of those that um, is a good one to pause if you're doing any um, re, um, revision around the hip or the hip ligaments pause it take a screenshot and then you can uh, and then you can revise from this so these are all the three ligaments pubofemoral ischiofemoral iliofemoral shows where they attach from and to and what movements they resist okay so st where it stabilizes the hip okay and then if you have a look here all three are lax during flexion so that is the position where if you are going to dislocate your hip, so in a game of rugby or something, your, your hip is flexed, someone then lands on you and, and kind of lands on your hip area, you're more likely to dislocate your hip in that position because that's where all three ligaments are at their loosest and the undersurface of the uh, capsule is thinner in that position. Okay, so it's um, so fairly similar to the uh, structure of the, of the shoulder. Cool. So we've had a look at the acetabulum, and the name acetabulum comes um, is Latin for vinegar cup because 
that's what it looks like. Okay, so when they start to open people up, that's uh, uh, that's why they called it the acetabulum. And uh, that we, you've got your labrum around it, which we've seen uh, seen before. And then we move on to the inguinal ligament. Okay, so this is the last bit for today. And uh, yeah, the these structures are really, really important. So we looked at this a little bit before, right at the beginning. So you've got ASIS at the top, this inguinal ligament coming all the way down onto the pubis just here. Now, if we have a look what's around here, you've got this muscle here. Uh, these are These are the wrong way around, actually. That's wrong. Uh, that's your ili iliacus, and that's your psoas. Okay, those are the wrong way around. Sorry about that. Uh, that's your femoral nerve. That's your femoral artery. That's your femoral vein. And then these are the um, lymph nodes around the femoral area. Okay, so what you can see is that there's this strong, thick connective tissue just there. Then the abdominal wall attaching into the top of it. And then underneath, you've got a gap where the blood vessels and the nerve supply go. So there's a weakness in this region. And um, in uh, males as well, we have the spermatic cord going down to the testes. So this is one of the reasons, um, this is one of the areas or the reasons why we get inguinal hernias, because we've got these structures that have to pass through to the, to the leg um, so if this was all sealed off, it would be no problem at all. But we've got to pass these tubes through somewhere. So if there's a if there's a an, a way that the uh, abdominal contents can go down, then it's going to be through one of these um, uh, kind of entryways down down into the lower leg. Okay, so we'll we'll talk about that a bit more when we get to the uh, get to the abdomen. But um, but that's how you get a hernia. Okay, that um, put through one of those areas. And then within that region, we discussed this um, around the knee as well, but you've got something called the femoral triangle. And um, this is uh, the inguinal ligament is your uh, top border of that triangle. So if you're a massage therapist um, and you've not really studied this area before, uh, this area, you've got to be careful of putting too much pressure in, okay, because there's very little covering these vessels there's just a bit of fascia okay so you've got your femoral nerve that comes underneath your inguinal ligament uh, you've also got your um, artery and vein and there's also lymphatic vessels there as well so the border of the sartorius here and the border of your adductor longus here as well that forms your femoral triangle Okay, so you don't really want to be putting an elbow into there. Okay, so um, all around here, treatment fine. All around sartorius, no problem. But yeah, uh, un by that in inguinal ligament, that would be uncomfortable anyway. Um, but also, you've got to be careful because of the uh, the vessels and the and the nerves that are around that region. Okay, so uh, just something to be aware of. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I'm not laughing at the man in pants. I'm laughing at Stevie's uh, <laughs> message here. So how the hell are you supposed to be able to palpate the psoas with all that around there? I don't know. Okay, um, I don't know. You, you affect the skin over the hip flexors, which then changes hip extension. That's the best way to explain it, I think. Yeah, so we, it, with all those things, and they go, well, yeah, but it works, you know. And uh, yeah, we're, we're releasing psoas. Um, okay, you can't be that specific. And uh, you'll see that as we add the layers of tissue on as well. Um, but if what we can say is by uh, putting pressure on the skin above the psoas, if there is a restriction in hip, in hip extension, it changes hip extension. The mechanism of that, no idea. Okay, so there we go. Uh, right then, this is how to remember where the things are around this inguinal area. So we've got the nerve, then the artery, then the vein, and then your Y fronts. Okay, so I don't, I'm just like putting up pictures of men in their pants. Um, that's, there is a reason for it. Uh, so let's have a look at this last video. So this is the inguinal ligament uh, just there. And you'll notice throughout today, 
I've said inguinal and inguinal as because it doesn't matter how you say it, it means the same thing, okay? Uh, so this forms the attachment of the lower abdominal wall just along here. There's this gap underneath here. So there's your ASIS, there's your pubic tubercle. And then, so this is the fascia, right, let me just pause that there. Okay, so this is the fascia that is over the top of those muscles. And then there's skin on top of this as well. So to access these areas, um, say access, there's, there's probably about five or six layers of tissue to go through before you get to iliacus, okay? Or before you get to psoas. So we can't say that we are on those muscles. It's impossible to say. Um, and that's why I say, look, you're treating the skin over the hip flexor region, which then affects hip extension. That is the most accurate that you can be. And uh, because we don't really understand what, um, the mechanisms behind it. Okay, so um, the, the, all of this attaches onto your um, inguinal ligament. And then the tense fasciolata attaches up onto there as well. But that's how dense it all is. Yeah, so it's not just like this. You've got all that tissue on top. Okay, so there is your iliacus. It took me ages to do this yesterday. Okay, so you've got iliacus just there. Then you've got psoas, which is sneaking through there. So that's the thinner one just there. Then um, you've got your nerve, your artery, your vein. So... Obviously, nerves are yellow, arteries are red, veins are blue, and then you've got your wire fronts, just like the chaps there. Okay, so that is how to remember the order of the vessels around that inguinal area there. Okay, so again, if you ever learn um, acupuncture, you do not want to be sticking acupuncture needles around this region here. It's, I mean, if, if ever, really, but um, if you wanted to do it and miss things, then you'd need it ultrasound guided. Okay, so um, yeah, th those structures are very superficial and um, yeah, the, you with an acupuncture needle, you would impact those structures, okay? Um, people will say that they're skilled at doing it, but um, you'd need to see, definitely. Okay, so that is it for today. Cool. Um, some things in there that might be news to you. I don't know. It uh, depends on your background, depends on what you've been taught before. Um, some good discussions there. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if you want any more information on that kind of stuff, then, uh, then give me a shout. Um, yep, perfect. Yeah, we can touch the skin. That's the only thing we can touch. Uh, doesn't mean we aren't affecting the structures underneath. Yeah, exactly. And that leads me nicely into, um, we are, we've got two guys coming over from Canada um, and um, the, Diane Jacobs, who is the person who kind of came up with DNM, Dermo Neuromodulation, she's retired and she's trained these two guys up, uh, Mike Rioche and Ray Allen, and they're both coming to our clinic in Birmingham. Uh, uh, first course, uh, first part of the course is in uh, March and then the second part is in June. So if you fancy learning about this nerve stuff, uh, dermo neuromodulation, uh, you can go to dnm.education um, uh, or on the movement therapy website as well, uh, or ask in the group if you want some more information. But this is the best theory we have about how this stuff works, okay? Because all the other stuff about affecting the tissue directly um, has been disproven. So um, yeah, it, 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 at the moment, the best theory is to do with the nervous system. So yeah, if you want to learn a bit more about that, you can get Diane's book, uh, Dermo Neuromodulation, or come on the course as well. Um, there is a course in Birmingham, and a chap called James Morgan is running one down in Exeter as well. Okay, so uh, yeah, feel free to get in touch uh, if you need any help with anything, and I will see you next week on Anatomy Monday.